Walter Scott in 1815 remembers being in London and having the advantage of a personal introduction to Lord Byron. Apparently they met every day for an hour or so in uh, uh, Mr. Murray's drawing room. Like the old heroes in Homer, we exchange gifts. I gave Byron a beautiful dagger mounted with gold, which had been the property of the redoubted Elfie Bay. But I was to play the part of diamond in the Iliad, for Byron sent me some time after a large sepulchral vase of silver. It was full of dead men's bones and had inscriptions on two sides of the base. One ran thus. The bones contained in this urn were found in certain ancient sepulchres within the land walls of Athens in the month of February, 1811. The other face bears the lines of Juvenal. Weigh Hannibal, how many pounds will you found, find in that great leader? Only death shows how contemptible the bodies of men are. The inscription dates the acquisition of the dead men's bones to one of Byron's early visits to Athens when he was resident in the Franciscan convent in the company of Fauvel, French vice consul, and who was also Lord Elgin's competitor, as well as Elgin's main man in that enterprise, the Italian painter Giovanni Battista Lucieri and the young Irish peer and colonial governor to be Marcus of Sligo, also involved in the purchase of antiquities. The added gravitas, quite literally suggested by the, the, the juvenile inscription on the other side of the urn, meant as a reminder of the ultimate weightlessness of all earthly ambition, is a caution that one might argue Byron liked to invoke, but did not ultimately heed. The same lines were repurposed in Byron's epigraph to his Ode to Napoleon, composed at the time of his hero's abdication of the throne of the world, a momentous event that Byron marked in melancholy contemplation. In this context, the gift's contents are quite literally a memento mori, a souvenir of a fundamentally different scale to Elgin's monumental museum-worthy fragments from a land already imbued with a funereal aura. The objects themselves, the urn and the dagger, but also the timing of their exchange are rich in historical significance and a certain delicious ironic poignancy that I would resonate with both men though perhaps with a different message. While Waterloo is still a few months away, the end of the Napoleonic project is clearly nigh, something that Byron would view glumly and Scott with a much more sanguine eye. The dagger belonging to the once formidable Mamluk chief, Mohammed Bey El Alfi, who had resisted the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt as an Anglo-Ottoman ally, speaks of battles and failed campaigns and is the perfect gift for the author of, among other Eastern tales, the Gyaur, the ninth edition of which Byron had dedicated to Scott. The silver urn amounts to a different kind of vanitas, more melancholy for sure, more deferent, but subtly too, subtly too, because of its Greek content, a nod to the invincibility of an idea and a riposte perhaps to the challenge of Scott's dagger. In more than one sense then, the attic bones are well defended in the Anglo-Scottish urn, mere remains, yet possible proof too, of the translatio libertatis, the translation of the libertarian spirit across time and space embraced by Byron and his circle. Scott may or may not have fully appreciated the implications of that Whiggish gesture, but already in 1813, in a letter to Byron, he had commented on Napoleon's ill-fated autumn campaign with a prescient association. This is Scott to Byron. What an awakening of dry bones seems to be taking place on the continent. I could as soon have believed in the resurrection of the Romans as in that of the Prussians, yet it seems a real and active renovation of national spirit. But what this vignette also speaks to is the mixed idiom of symbolization within that exchange formula. We can discern in the synecdochical logic of the gifts, the romance and exoticism of the East, but also of techniques of collection and knowledge production that underpin projects such as the Grand Tour and antiquarian curation. For the late Susan Manning, in its obsession with material particularities, antiquarianism was the other of Enlightenment historiography, the double agent on its boundaries, obsessed with the flotsam and jessam of the past, yet lacking the connectivity that made for grand historical narrative. And there is a kind of obsession here with material remains of the past, 
that speaks of this antiquarian reflex, a strong one in the case of Scott, of course, who saw himself as an antiquarian clearinghouse for objects and for information, as Ian Gordon Brown puts it. Though from the opposite political corner, as it were, Scott's respect for Byron was built on the common ground of their interest in popular song and the curation of vernacular idioms as survivals of the past. Byron's debt to Scott's minstrelsy of the Scottish border is partly paid in Child Harold, another curated collection of vernacular material with its own techniques of recording and translation. Such projects of curation and translation, as we know, prepared the ground for the resurgence of Greece as a serious prospect of awakening of dry bones. But as an active field of political, cultural, and identitarian struggles, the Greek war proved an unfortunate testing ground for Byron's commitment to the Translatio Libertatis. And though Scott was sympathetic to the idea of a rudely interrupted but unassailable continuity between Greece's past and present, the mooted project of a Greek field trip in 1831 never materialized. So to put some flesh on the old antiquarian bones, as it were, we need to trace the arc of what under the initial rubric of Philhellenism as the temporalization of a translatable exchangeable idea becomes a complex engagement with Greece as political and cultural reality during and after the revolution. We can then see in action what enlightenment historians call cultural transfer and trace its vicissitudes, specificities and continuities. The specificities I'm interested in today are Scottish and traced through a longer Philhellenic trajectory, starting from the period immediately following the Byron and Scott gift exchange that I started with and ending in the late 1890s. I'd like to start uh, my arc, my serendipitous random arc with the case of the Aberdonian Edward Masson classically trained schoolmaster, interpreter, translator, lawyer, first Lord Advocate of Greece, professor and minister of the Free Church of Scotland. Masson's lifelong investment in Greek matters is both exemplary and eccentric. Approached though, through the perspective of a collective biography adopted recently by Anna Karakatsouli in her valuable study of transnational philhellenisms, his case would be exemplary in the sense of belonging to a group in the fringes of the official British state, disaffected by its position in Greece. In that sense, Masson is an interesting type in the context of what we would term now a four nations approach to British philhellenism, and which I think is both necessary and under-researched. And I, I uh, um, would hope that my work contributes to, to unraveling that approach or through a wider lens in terms Karakatsuli borrows from Adam Zamoyski, a mass and mayor to stretch fit the profile of the holy madman beset by religious fervor forming a conservative international. <laughs> but there are important intranational specificities too, which I think belie that. As a man of the Kirk, Masson rallied to a cause already interpreted in his immediate context in the Presbyterian idiom through which he had formed his strongest identifications and the evangelical mission of bringing light and knowledge to the needy. Yet his conduct in Greece, where he reinvented himself professionally and politically, and the attempts to fashion an intellectual voice for two audiences at once, amount to a fascinating eccentricity too. Uh, of humble origins, son of a weaver, but clearly precocious and risen to distinction as a graduate of King's College Aberdeen, where he studied classics, and of the University of Edinburgh, where he was a divinity student, as well as a member of the Reformed Church, Edward Masson attached himself to the Greek cause as early as 1822. In later accounts, he recalled attending the public meeting in behalf of the Greeks in August of 1822, held in Edinburgh's Merchants Hall. After the Chios massacre, which galvanized an up to that point rather sluggish response to the revolution, at least in Britain. The numerous and very respectable meeting to take into consideration the case of the unfortunate Greeks and to enter into some measures for the relief was the first public meeting which had been held in Britain upon the subject, a fact that Masson never tired of pointing out. 
Quoting from the detailed account in The Scotsman of 10th August 1822, Masson singled out the passionate address by the Reverend Dr. McCree, illustrious biographer of Knox and Melville, as the historian of our own Scottish struggles for religious and civil liberty, was of all others, the person who could most appropriately take the lead on such occasion. McCree's rousing speech, Masson recalls, drew from me in early youth tears of enthusiasm. In a later account in 1860, Masson cited McCree's concluding words with meaningful emphasis. This is McCree. I think I hear the angel of providence in communicating to Western Europe through the instrumentality of living Greeks, the Greek scriptures and all the stores of Grecian literature thus address the inhabitants. These will aid you in effecting your emancipation from the shackles of despotism, which have entwined themselves around mind and body. It is in this echo chamber of formative declamations that we may find resonances of the particular mindset and worldview that in its own small and singular way inflected the understanding of the Greek cause as a vanguard exemplary concern for us, a son of Albin, fired up by the spirit of the covenant and of the Grampians, as he put it. In an important sense, McCree's rallying call in that meeting aimed to rouse more than sympathy for a Christian people in peril as would befit the vociferous critic of the dismissive treatment of the Covenanters by Walter Scott in his Old Mortality, about which McCree wrote uh, uh, a scathing review. The minister of the Constitutional Associate Presbytery stakes a claim here to the authentic response of the righteous to a just cause. Now, if you also take into account that the meeting on behalf of the, the Greeks that McCree addressed uh, took place three days before the arrival in Edinburgh of George IV, the first by an English sovereign in 150 years, which was stage managed as a tartan extravaganza by Walter Scott as chairman of the Celtic Society of Edinburgh. Um, and I have here some, um, well, the official portrait of, of the king in his, uh, 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 in, in Scottish dress, uh, very much, um, designed by, uh, by Scott and the Celtic Society. And then the, of course, the inevitable caricature uh, um, uh, that followed it. And at the same time, if you also take into account that less than two years before the 1820 risings had taken place in among other cities, Edinburgh, uh, um, under the banner of uh, no lords, no bishops, then uh, McCree's was fighting talk in more than one sense, you could argue. In any case, by August 1824, Masson was on his way to Greece, sailing on the Florida, under the auspices of the education branch of the London Greek Committee. His poem, Adieu, is, is, is written to, uh, um, at that point. Having settled in Ivra, after the rather dilatory response of the Greek government to his solicitations that he oversee the establishment of a system of schools over the whole country, Masson gave instruction gratuitously to several young men in the English language, as he put it. As the American doctor and philoline Samuel Gridley Howe noted in his journal, he speaks the modern Greek with ease and elegance and is proficient in the Hellenic. Should he be spared, he will be the silent but powerful organ of the distribution of knowledge through this country. Indeed, Masson was more than spared. His extraordinary command of the language earned him the, po the post of secretary and interpreter to the fellow Scot Thomas Cochran, heir to the, the title of Earl of Dundonald, on his commission as High Admiral of the Greek Navy. Cochran, the greatest man afloat, as he was known, whose portfolio of dashing naval adventures was hugely impressive, was also notorious for pretty serious scrapes with military authority and a conviction for stock exchange fraud for which he served time in 1814. Having bounced back, Cochrane was available for new adventures by 1825 when he negotiated with the commissioners of the second English loan, a lucrative deal for taking up the Greek post. He eventually arrived probably at the most critical moment of the Greek struggle in the spring of 1827, when the war seemed lost. 
tasked with aiding the expeditions to relieve the besieged Acropolis garrison and recapture Athens, Cochrane was to support Karaiskakis and his men positioned in Faliro. Everyone who was anyone was there. Witnesses to one of the most dramatic and for many avoidable Greek defeats, Colonel Thomas Gordon, another Scot who resigned in exasperation twice, George Finley, uh, um, um, presides in many ways over, over this uh, uh, BSA event. Edward Blackheer, Frank Abney Hastings in command of the Carteria, Samuel Gridley Howe as its chief surgeon, General Macriyanis, assorted French and Swiss philolines, and Edward Masson. The Bavarian Colonel um, Karl Wilhelm von Heideck, later a member of King Otto's Regency Council, was also present, sketchpad in hand. Heideck's painting of Karaiskakis's camp transfigures the scene into a military idyll of calm anticipation, on which uh, Fyodor Brizakis models his slightly more dramatic rendition, which in turn monumentalizes the presence of foreign fighters among the Greeks. We can only imagine mass and there, following the many accounts of surviving participants, such as Finley's Gordon's house, but more dramatically Black Hairs, who sketches the scene of Cochrane's first visit to Karaiskaki's camp. After the conference, Cochrane, flanked by his British officers in splendid uniforms, addressed the Greeks through his interpreter, Edward Masson. Masson's flow of Greek and appropriate gesticulations were much admired as he urged the Hellenes to fight for their country, holding up a large blue and white flag with an owl as the centerpiece, a flag which Cochrane had purchased at Marseille. As is well known, there were moments of bravery, but also of chaos and confusion that caused the accidental and fatal wounding of Karaiskakis, who died on one of Cochrane's vessels before the rushed and according to all witnesses, rash charge led by Cochrane. Present at the Greek side, along with the Admiral was Masson, through whom Karaiskakis delivered his dying words. Now I offer this vignette not so much as a dramatic detail by which to color in the as yet sketchy portrait of Masson as first hand witness to the war, but to note the omission of the event from his own curation of that witnessing. Unlike Finley, Gordon, Blackhair, or Howe, Masson was clearly not immediately concerned with historical narratives or memoirs, preoccupied as he soon became with the demands of high office in the newly independent nation, which he served having trained as a lawyer and then during the Regency as the country's first Lord Advocate. In that guise, his involvement was immersive. Masson had already served as defense counsel for George Mavromichalis, one of Capodistria's ass assassins, and pleaded unsuccessfully for acquittal on the basis of his client's role as a victim of a political plot, portraying, hi portraying him in his last hours as a flawed Christian. In the first of his compilations of Anglo-Greek material, um, Philolinica, or poetic translations with an introduction on the condition and prospects uh, of the Greek nation by a Scottish Philoline, published in Edinburgh in 1852, among his own translations into New Testament Greek of such classics as Wordsworth's She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Ways, Moore's A Minstrel Boy, Burns' Scots Were Hay, Masson includes renditions in English of Alexand Alexander Soutos's sympathetic soliloquy of George Mavromichalis alongside another scathing satire by the virulently anti capodistrian poet. By way of illustration of the peculiar warfare in the Greek and foreign public sphere that ultimately, in Masson's view, caused Capodistria's undoing. Uh, um, interestingly, um, uh, Masson, in, in, in his other writing, um, uh, claims to have been a fairly close friend to Capodistria and to have admired the man, but still to have been able to defend George Mavromichalis. The political or indeed partisan always attends the lyrical in Masson's fashioning of himself as a Scottish facilitator of an imagined Anglo-Greek special relationship, despite his claims to inform neutrality. The terms of that alliance for Masson are underpinned by the need to defend the unique experiment of the new Greek nation from the attacks of its twin enemies, Russia and Rome. To instruct his readers in the anti-papist cause, as he put it. Masson translates into Greek accounts from the British press 
of the London lecture tour in 1851 of Italian patriot and ex-Catholic monk Alessandro Gavazzi, another fascinating agent of cultural transfer or a willful tra translatio libertatis that transcended the language barrier. Gavazzi, who had already enthralled Scottish audiences in the late 1840s, apparently delivered his orations in Italian and then gave his own fractured English version. Here's Masson introducing him to a Greek readership in Philolinica. This is my translation of his Greek translation. 1848, year of fertile political change, has made many previously unknown magnanimous men famous around the world. There is, however, also Gavazzi, an Italian priest who has shown irrepressible zeal, extraordinary astuteness, fiery rhetoric, and indomitable valor, rallying his fellow citizens in the struggle for the political and ecclesiastic renaissance of their country. Masson triangulates Italy with Greece and Scotland here by rallying the allied energies of the 1848 rebellions to the transnational cause of what he calls elsewhere, the genuine Catholicity of the true church. According to Masson, the Scottish reformers acted on thoroughly Catholic and conservative principles. Their declared object was to bring back, to restore the face of the primitive Kirk and the restored reformed national communion they denominated the reformed Catholic Kirk of Scotland. Masson argued for the deep affinities between the Eastern and Protestant churches on those grounds. The historic testimony of the Eastern church, uninterrupted and unvaried since the days of the apostles is an invaluable living witness to the Protestant cause. The Greeks at the present day still hold and teach those very principles for which British martyrs at the Reformation died at the stake. The statement though to some may be appear, it may appear strange is indubitable. Masson's Presbyterian training in compelling oration combined with his own legal skills was most controversially deployed in his performance as public prosecutor in the 1834 trial of the retired General Colocotronis and his alleged co-conspirator General Plaputas for high treason, that is for their instigation of a plot against the Regency. In what is now considered to have been a show trial, Masson, appointed by the Regency, was allegedly involved in the manipulation and bribing of witnesses and the intimidation of the judges two of whom refused to sign the death sentence and were forced by bayonet wielding policemen to be present when the verdict was announced. The proceedings of the trial record only a summary of Masson's speech, which was in Greek, and which apparently lasted five and a half hours. We will never know what a legal tirade by a Scottish master of the Greek tongue sounded like, but we can perhaps imagine the tone in which it was delivered. Not unlike the witnesses to Father Gavazzi's mesmerizing performances, in incomprehensible Italian, the Napoleon courtroom audience was supposed to have been dumbfounded. The proceedings reproduced by Greek historians as testament both to the machinations of the Regency and its broader pernici pernicious influence on in post-independence Greek politics firmly placed Masson on the wrong side of history. The death sentence was immediately converted to life imprisonment and the King later pardoned the generals, of course, while the two dissenting judges acquitted in a sub subsequent trial, again prosecuted by Masson, became icons of the resistance to Bavarian rule. Later to be invoked as prototypes of integrity and justice in another moment of danger for the Greek polity, that is the immediate aftermath of the 1967-1973 dictatorship. Panos Lico Frivis's 1974 period film, Iviket on the Caston, Judges on Trial, cast Masson as a formidable but villainous force prone to legal sophistry and near demented histrionics. In this vignette, Masson appears as the agent of a translatio tyrannidis rather than libertatis. And it is perhaps understandable that he does not stress that particular legal victory in later accounts of himself. The episode did generate a further accolade, however, albeit for the wrong reasons. News of the general's conviction inspired the local anonymous bards to compose uh, two songs relating uh, uh, the events. And here is one called the Tragudi to Platano, the plain song. I provided a just very brief uh, prose translation, but here is Masson's uh, uh, Masson featuring. 
uh, as the legendary villain. Φαινομαντάτα θλιβερά, φαρμακερά χαμπέρια, ο Μάσονας και ο Σκηνάς με αυτούς τους βαρβαρέζους βουλή έβαλανε κακοί το στρατηγό να κόψουν. I bring sad, terrible news. Masson and Skinas, together with the barbarians, set out to destroy the general. Um, as I said, this, this may be uh, uh, Masson featuring as a legendary villain in a popular memorialization uh, of uh, this folk song, but that's one that neither Byron nor most other philolines uh, uh, could claim. The fallout from the general's trial did not deter Masson, who went on to defend successfully one of the members of the Philorthodox Society brought to trial again for an alleged anti otto conspiracy in 1840, and then to take up a professorship in history at the recently founded University of Athens. In a sign of things to come, Masson did not hold the post for very long, and though he demitted for health reasons, accounts suggest more serious issues, including student discontent. Masson's last official engagement was the chair in biblical and ecclesiastic Greek at the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland's college at Belfast, to which he was appointed in 1847. Barely three months in the post, Masson found himself in the middle of yet another Greek war, a term used by a contemporary newspaper, to refer to the controversy caused by Masson's introductory lecture and the intention of teaching his students classical and Hellenistic Greek through the Romaic of the Fathers, as the, his detractors put it, and in the native Greek pronunciation to boot. For Masson, uh, a knowledge of the living language and modern literature of the Greeks is of far greater importance than biblical philologists are as yet generally aware, as in fact, as Masson puts it, the manner in which Greek prose is universally read and spoken in Athens at this day is precisely the same as that in general use among the Athenians of the apostolic age. The war raged on the front pages of the Belfast newspapers, the banner of Ulster, who was for Masson and the Northern Whig against through November and December of that year. The exchanges feature expert commentary and the kind of choice invective that only academics can deliver with such a plum. While one writer wrings his hands at the thought that the rising generation of the assembly are being flooded with a muddy stream of modern Greek, and another challenges mass into an academic duel, the Trinity College Dublin classicist signing his letters Junius deserves the prize for the most shattering attack on Masson's apostate theories of education suggesting that Masson may have been under the influence of chloroform held beneath his oriental nostrils, or for the coup de grace, wondering, is there any possibility that the individual who has imbibed so ardent a love for the literature, pronunciation, and prosody of modern Greece may be partial to her theology likewise? Needless to say, this didn't end well. Masson held on to the post just, at least on paper, meanwhile seeking gainful employment elsewhere, including Edinburgh and King's College Aberdeen, when in 1852 and 1854, he hoped to be appointed to the Greek chair. Unsurprisingly, his hopes were dashed. The very public Belfast debacle can't have helped, but he was also up against such luminaries as John Stuart Blackie, the Glasgow-born and Aberdeen and Edinburgh-educated scholar of classics, theology and law whose 1850 translation of Aeschylus had been enthusiastically received. Blackie was appointed to the Edinburgh chair and went on to build a legendary profile as the most distinguished Scotsman of the day. Interestingly enough, at least for my purposes today, his reputation ultimately owed much to his approach to the instrumentality of living Greeks, as McCree put it, and as pioneered by Masson in a sense. Aware of Masson's travails and supportive of his one-man campaign to reverse the prejudice, prejudice against the modern idiom, Blackie acknowledged Masson's mastery of the Greek language. In turn, Masson cited Blackie's work in admiration and provided him with a testimonial for the Edinburgh chair application, composed in flawless New Testament Greek. But Blackie reached areas which Masson never managed to access. A unionist nationalist, he contributed to the Scottish revival, a vision of cultural originality and continuity, arguably inspired by the modern Greek example, or in a recurring phrase that resonates with the McCree call, 
the living language of the Greeks. This was not just a matter of classical pedagogy and the scholarly debate over pronunciation, however, but an ethical and political stance. As he put it in his inaugural lecture, have a respect for Marathon, but remember also Mesolonghi. Do not look abroad on the glowing isles and the pine covered hills of Greece with a coldly curious eye of a mere lexicographer and a grammarian and learn to feel that the scanty population of that so often and so cruelly desolated land has claims on you as scholars and as men, such as no other country on earth can have, saving only the little peculiar country of the Hebrews. Shake off therefore in your Greek studies, the nice trammels of a merely scholastic classicality. Study Greek as men with all the mass of your living manhood. Honor Thucydides by your means and luxuriate in Herodotus, but be ashamed to be ignorant of Trikupi. Have a large heart for everything living, for living Greece particularly, and for the living Greeks. In pursuit of that vision, Blackie visited Greece a number of times from the spring of 1853 onwards. He spent some colorful days in Athens in the company of George Finley and Greek and Scottish literati, exploring but dismissing the experience of the Orthodox liturgy. And according to a fellow traveler, regaling bemused passers-by from some steps in the marketplace with a pitch accent recitation from Homer. A crowd soon gathered round on the outskirts of which one modern Greek was heard to ask, what is the meaning of this? To which another replied, oh, it's only a crazy old Scotchman saying his prayers. Blackie's letters home are peppered with Greco-Scottish views of the famous mountain Lycabetus, overhangs Athens as Arthur's seat does Edinburgh, and of Parnassus. How small or mightiest bends look when contrasted with his classic Parnassos, he wrote to his wife, adding, please accent the last syllable. These commonplaces of a classically minded traveler pick up resonance when read alongside other instances of cultural projection in Blackie's writing, such as this impassioned account of the geographic and political Scottish landscape in his 1885 histor historical economical inquiry on the Scottish Highlanders and the landlords. For not only they, that is lowlanders, but even the other class of English purchasers who really meant to perform the duties of resident landlords and improve their estates had come to the Highlands with the idea that by their mere presence, they were conferring a great benefit on the semi-barbarous people whose lands they had acquired a people speaking an antediluvian jargon that no man could understand, professing a religion that no man could enjoy. In fact, it would not be too much to say that a large section of this class had as great a contempt for the soul of the Highlands and all its best moral and lyrical culture as the Turks during their 500 years in Europe have shown for the Greeks and other Christian peoples under their sway. So I just need to get some light. Meanwhile, Edward Masson was never vindicated at Belfast, despite his fiery defense of his pedagogical methods and lifelong commitment to education in the college committee meetings where his fate was to be decided. On trial himself, ironically, as it turned out, for his overzealous belief in the principle of Greek linguistic continuity and his idiosyncratic interpretation of Greek as a timeless evangelical lingua franca, he was in a sense a victim of the volatility of forces unleashed by reawakenings and projects of renovation in many hands. Knighted by King Otto in absentia and peripatetic for a few years after the Belfast controversy, teaching private Greek classes and preaching, he returned to Athens in 1865, where he continued briefly to publish short-lived journals with the aim of supporting Greek philology, the good governance and true independence of Greece, the eventual political unification of the Panhellenium and the restitution of the good name of Greece and the Greeks in the face of calumnies and misunderstandings perpetuated by the foreign press based in the country. He signed his name, Eduardos Masson Calidonios, Edward Masson Caledonian. As the brother-in-law of Mrs. Francis Hill, having married her sister, Elizabeth Mulligan in 1838, Masson became a member of another Philhellenic family and operation led by the Reverend John Hill, who had settled in Athens at the behest of the American Protestant Episcopal Board Mission. The Hills founded a school for girls in 1831, followed for, uh, by another for boys and a more advanced institute, 
which survived the vicissitudes of mission politics and eventually merged into the private institution that operates to this day. Masson's eldest daughter, Bessie Masson, directed the Hill School from 1884 to 1917, and the first names of his children, Bessie and John, a third child Francis only lived for a year, feature in the school family tree well into the 2000s. The current director of Hill School is Mini Panagiotopoulou Kara, granddaughter of Bessie Masson and Livizato, who so graciously allowed me access to the school's archive, recalled in conversation her great-great-grandfather's reputation as the black sheep of the family. The headstone in the Athens New Protestant Cemetery where Edward Masson is buried reads, a mind richly stored, guilelessness and scrupulous integrity characterize a life devoted to the welfare of Greece. But I want to end today's sampling of Scottish Grecophilia with a brief presentation of a daughter of Albin. Isabella Fivey Mayo, born into a London-based middle-class Aberdonian family, was by the time she published her Greek tale, a prolific author of popular novels and short stories, and an active speaker and campaigner for anti-imperialist, anti-racist, pacifist, and women workers' causes. When she moved to Aberdeen as a 35-year-old widow in 1878, Mayo's literary reputation as a writer for mainstream religious family periodicals would have preceded her in, in religious and university circles, though most of her serials and books had appeared under the pseudonym Edward Garrett. An evangelical Christian socialist and Tolstoyan ethical anarchist by the mid-1890s, Mayo sought to promote social revolution through the slow, peaceful process of personal reformation, leading to a free individual life, the force of which she considered to be the salt of the earth. In an 1894 lecture of that title for the Aberdeen Sabbath School Union, according to a newspaper report, she spoke of small beginnings that led to great endings. And she proceeded to illustrate her doctrine by referring to the causes which ultimately produced Bonnian and his work and which produced the Glasgow Foundry Boys organization through the labors of a factory girl. She went on to show how evils might be averted by the force of individual heroism. A daughter, sorry, a daughter of the clefts or a girl of modern Greece tells a salt of the earth tale in the guise of part historical, part ethnographic romance published by Chambers, spe specialists in educational books and featuring in their prize and presentation series it tells the story of Patience Hedges, a foundling raised in England, who is recognized and reclaimed by her Greek relatives, who happen to be cousins of General Kolokotronis, while in London in 1815, raising funds for the Greek struggle. Now known as Stella Farmakis, the girl joins the revolution, marries a palikar, witnesses the joys and horrors of the war, survives the Missolonghi siege, and settles in Athens to begin the good work of national restoration, each doing one's own little share. Though fitting the mold of the period's anxiety over the prospects and representations of girlhood, uh, Mayo's didacticism is aimed equally at adult concerns, such as freedom, justice, personal and political self-determination, and the ethics of empathy and rootedness in an authentic national culture. Unlike other Victorian romances of the Greek War of Independence, such as Justin McCarthy's Maid of Athens of 1883, or Mrs. Edmonds's Amygdala, A Tale of the Greek Revolution, probably the, the best known of that uh, 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 genre, Mayer's Daughter of the Clefts is not an allegorical maiden, embodiment of a country in distress, saved by a male hero enthralled to an ideal. In fact, there is no male hero in the novel, other than the anonymous brave Palikars, whose emblematic dress is readily donned by equally brave girls when the occasion demands it. This is um, um, an illustration from, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, from the novel um, depicting the, the Missolonghi exodus that uh, uh, Patience comes Stella and her husband Constantine survive 
and um, for that um, uh, patients donned as it were the the, the, the palikar's uh, dress, and this is. This is a effectively uh, Mayo adopting in her tale a legendary uh, uh, vignette of a, um, a woman who apparently in 1881 was carried to her grave in Athens in the dress of a palika, which she had worn when fighting by her father's side at Mitsolongi. This is a long, uh, um, many stories um, celebrating the um, uh, women fighters in, in, in Palikar, as it were, uh, garb. Instead, the commanding presences in the novel are Miss Lane, proto-feminist egalitarian teacher who introduces patients to her friend, the poet artist William Blake, and Mrs. Fowler, who invites patients into her family, who is an Aberdonian tall and handsome woman full of poetic positivity and ready to speak her mind when provoked, as in this response to a young woman's jingoistic anti-French reflex. Remember, this is at this moment, we're in 1815. She laughed again, this is Mrs. Fowler. We're at war with some of them, she said. We're fighting for the French royalties now. Once we used to fight with them, I can't make it out. I've known French people of all sorts, Republican, Royalist, Bonapartist, and I've got on well with all, all of them and I've liked and respected most of them. Perhaps that is partly through my Scotch blood. You see, the old Scottish nation was ever so much more friendly with France than it was with England itself. And Faith, I feel the ancient feud with England is in me yet. Why is it always English this and English that and England, England, when it ought to be Great Britain and Ireland? Who carries the business of England over the world? The Scotch. Who fights for England and does her hardest work? The Irish. I was always on the side of the Irish against Lord Castlereagh, whom I hate. There used to be a deal of talk just after I was married about the way the Turks treat the Greeks. And there's a deal of talk just now over the way Russia is using Poland. But I guess governments are much of a muchness in the way they treat those they get into their power. In old times, weren't the Irish ordered to dress like the English? whether they could afford it or not, poor dears, and didn't England forbid the Highland kilt? I don't believe Scotland would be able to put up peaceably with England at all if Scotland had ever been conquered. Instead of that, she gave England her kings, such as they are. She wasn't so proud of the breed as to want to keep it all to herself. And so she puts up with England, just as one puts up with forward people who don't know manners. No prizes for guessing on which Aberdonian pacifist anarchist Mrs. Fowler is based. Yet this is not just a case of authorial indulgence, uh, doing a little bit of a caricature. Mayo's representation of the staple Victorian foster mother as a woman of independent and strong political views is interesting in its own right, but it is the correlation between the dissenting, dissenting Scottishness and the natural empathy with a Greek girl that gives it more weight and specificity to my eyes. Empathy is a key conduit here, and it takes many forms, including most significantly for the plot, the resilience of a deep-seated, embodied national memory reactivated through song and lament, a kind of national telepathy, as it were. Patience is prone to such stirrings. When Miss Lane came upon her, she was sitting idly, her head against the wall, crooning a monotonous wailing sound to which she put no words. Why, where did you get that sad song? Asked Miss Lane playfully. Patience started and hesitated. She did not seem to have noticed what she was singing. So she crooned on again for a moment and then said, I think it is what I heard some foreigners singing when I was out with the followers on the night of the illuminations. This is the, uh, the scene to which um, Patience refers. This is the night of the Waterloo illuminations in London. Suddenly at the juncture where Chancery Lane cuts into narrow Fleet Street and where the crowd was densest, a new sound was heard which yet did not sound above, but as it were below the general hubbub. It was the sound of many voices joined in a steady monotonous chant, which had about it something infinitely wild and pathetic. Well, to be sure, said Mrs. Fowler, what funny people are these? Surely they don't bring out lunatics to see illuminations. They're not lunatics, they are Greeks, said Mr. Pavitt. There's always a lot of them in London doing business. And I heard there are some, 
some come over lately from Paris. Would Bonaparte have done anything to the Greeks, asked Mrs. Fowler in a woman's generalizing way. Oh dear, no, Mr. Pavitt answered, but they might have had to fight on one side or the other, and there's some of them who make believe they don't want to be mixed up with any country but their dear Greece. But they will never be able to do anything for Greece. It's a used up country. Don't you remember Byron's poetry about Greece? Everything that Byron says is in gospel, remarked Mrs. Fowler coolly. So though Mrs. Fowler cannot immediately receive the new sound of the wild and pathetic chant bursting through the cheers of the crowds gathered for the, the victory illuminations, she has enough nous to doubt the official lines on the matter. Pitting Byron's poetry against Greek song is another subtle, or perhaps not so subtle, dig at received opinion, but also the unreliability or presumption of certain forms of mediation. Though Mayo engages in that herself as she repurposes material from recent translations of Greek poetry, folk song, 1821 memoirs and biographies, as well as her own impressions from her visits to Greece, uh, her sentimental empathetic, uh, 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 the sentimental empathetic address of her romance counterbalances the allegorical tenor of the national tale. In a sense, if it is a national tale, Mayo's is a, if you want, transnational tale, for in a sense, what the story speaks to is a joint recognition and awakening. The reformation of characters such as Mrs. Fowler and indirectly the reader, through the conversion and exemplary commitment of a girl with roots in two communities. Though non-denominational, Mayo was inspired by Scottish Presbyterian speakers and activists, especially of the anti-imperialist pacifist kind, as figures of integrity and conviction, and at least a version of the Protestant spirit of independent interpretation inflects her ethical anarchist Christian socialist doctrine of the force of the individual life. An aspect of that, as a daughter of the cleft suggests, is the awareness and the ability to recognize both particularities and affinities, or the deeper continuities between nations and cultures. As she puts it in her account of a visit to Athens at Easter time in 1896, the modern Greek reminds me of the Scotsman. Like the Scotsman too, he is often grave and stern or pathetic of aspect, and he makes very little palaver and no display of deference. He's a human being. You are a human being. That is the relation between you. Thank you very much. <laughs>